Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you. A little teaser next Sunday, don't miss it because we're getting to that very passage that says Christ in you and uh, spoiler alert, like this is what the whole series next Sunday hinges on, um, the mystery revealed and so that'll be next Sunday. Today, uh, I'm curious, how many of you have ever dislocated a joint? Yeah, all right, I'm not alone. So for me, uh, this wonderfully fun experience happened first in high school, and through my, my high school and college years playing basketball, I dislocated my shoulder 15 times. Yes, I am an overachiever. Yes. And uh, I, I wish we had a, a VHS player in the sound booth. If you're under 20, just Google it. You can find out what that is. Because we cop- captured this experience on film the first time I lo- dislocated my shoulder, and I've relived it many times. Um, and it's, it's not fun watching it or experiencing it. So the first time I dislocated my shoulder, the, the pain was just not, it was excruciating. And so I was uh, backpedaling down the lane, and the, the, I was on defense, and I somehow got tripped up with somebody else's feet. And so I went down, and I broke, I don't recommend doing this, I broke my fall with my hand out like this, and the minute my hand hit the ground, boom. My, my shoulder popped out of socket. And uh, I can remember like it happened yesterday, the, the pain of writhing around on the floor um, with my shoulder dislocated and just praying for something, uh, some kind of mercy, right? Like it was miserable. And uh, some of you can relate to that pain. Now some of you, just as a side note, are like a friend of mine in high school who dislocated her, her shoulder just for fun. She's like, look at this, hoo-hoo. I'm not talking about that, like this hurt, all right? Some of you have weird joints, right? You're like, look at my hand, I can make it twist in ways it shouldn't twist. This hurt really bad. And uh, I hope that uh, most of you in the room can't relate to the pain of, of that dislocation. But what we're gonna look at in scripture today is a scripture that reminds us that all of us can relate to the sense of being dislocated, disjointed, broken in our human experience and in this world. And so we're going to look at this scripture uh, in Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to start at verse 19, and I'm going to, so this is, we we ended in verse 20 last week, so we're going to do 19 to 23 today, and I'm going to read it in the message paraphrase version. So spacious is he, so roomy, that everything of God finds its proper place in him, in Christ, without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death, his blood that poured down from the cross." You yourselves are a case study of what he does. At one time, you all had your backs turned to God, thinking rebellious thoughts of him, giving him trouble every chance you got. But now, by giving himself completely at the cross, actually dying for you, Christ brought you over to God's side and put your lives together, whole and holy in his presence." You don't walk away from a gift like that. You stay grounded and steady in that bond of trust, constantly tuned in to the message, careful not to be distracted or diverted. There is no other message, just this one. Every creature under heaven gets this same message, 
I, Paul, am a messenger of this message. So when I uh, dislocated my shoulder that first time, if I had it, I would have paid a million dollars for anybody that could bring relief to that pain, right? Uh, nobody had to tell me, I think there's something wrong with your shoulder, right? It, it looks terrible, right? And, and it hurt like crazy. And this passage describes the brokenness and dislocatedness, right, of, of humanity and of really all creation. And I want to talk for a few moments about our experience of that brokenness and dislocatedness. That, that's, it comes in different ways, and sometimes it's more of a crisis, like I described with my dislocation, and sometimes it's more of a chronic nature. It kind of comes in different ways, and, and I'm working with the assumption that everybody in the room is familiar with both kinds of pain and brokenness and dislocatedness. That sometimes um, the, the parts of our lives that are out of place and out of whack, that, that are not quite right, that we experience that in significant problems that loom large in our lives, like divorce or diagnosis of an illness or the loss of a loved one. Or maybe it's depression or anxiety or something else that looms large in your life. Maybe for some, that, the thing that looms large is, is just the daily constant ache of loneliness. And there's never a time when it's not with you and you're experiencing that pain. Sometimes the, the crisis kind of pain of our disjointedness can find expression in, in anger or rage or in addiction. It comes in lots of different ways, but there are, are times in our lives, and some of us in the room are in these times right now. You are in the midst of a crisis kind of experience of this brokenness this dislocatedness that the Apostle Paul is describing. And nobody has to tell you that there's something not quite right. When you wake up and like you're not sure you want to get out of bed and you're not sure you can tackle the day, nobody has to tell you, hey, something's up here, right? When you just stop in the middle of the day and weep for no reason, but there is a reason, right? Nobody has to tell you there's something going on here. When you're in the midst of crisis, there's an awareness that something is not quite right. And if that's you today, I just want you to hang with me because there's good news in God's word for you today. Now, some of us are not in that kind of place. We're, we're experiencing this brokenness, this dislocatedness that the Apostle Paul describes in more of a, more of a subtle way. We might call it a chronic kind of experience. It's not big and flashy, and other people might not even know that we're experiencing this on the inside, but we know. And um, we know that we're experiencing it, and uh, something's not quite right, but we just kind of keep trying to go on like it's okay. It's kind of like uh, I disclosed my shoulder 15 times, I told you. After about 10 or 12, it hurt about as much as a bad sprained ankle, all right? Like you just messed up the shoulder so much, right? And so after about like the 12th time, I wish I could show you a tape, like I would pop my shoulder out, I'd walk over to the bench where my twin brother was, like this, because he popped his shoulder out a lot too because he wanted to be like his big brother. Anyway, so the doctor taught us how to put him back in socket because the doctor couldn't do it because of liability. So we would literally just spend high school and college putting our shoulders back in socket and like you can watch on a film, I'd just walk over and be like, my brother would come out. He'd take my arm and kind of rotate it like this, and it'd pop back in socket, right? And uh, there were more than a few games, I actually, they, they just kind of tape it back down tighter, and then I'd go back in the game and play. Now, just to be clear, it still hurt, and it still wasn't quite right. I was just acting like it was, right? I was just acting like I was okay, and I can go in and play. Uh, but if you ever seen somebody play one-armed, it was not really that impressive, all right? And some of us, we can deal with our, our, this kind of chronic brokenness, this disjointedness in that way. Like we have a sense that something's not quite right. 
but we just find ways to deal with it. Tape it down, go in, ice it a little bit more. Like ways to cope or to fix that sense of dislocatedness. You know, like, and not everybody's aware of it, so you, you come home from a long day of work and you just kind of get in the habit of, you know, several glasses of wine or a few beers just to take the edge off. It just eases things a little bit, right? And you're not a raging drunk, but there's a sense of something's a little off, right? Or, uh, you know, you're feeling at work like lots of pressure, like a failure, you're experiencing rejection, and so when nobody's looking, you're just, you're just scrolling through your phone at images you got no business looking at. You're not having an affair. That'd be crisis, right? Just, just coping, just kind of fixing, deadening the pain a little bit with a little bit of an escape, right? Or, or even, uh, you know, life is not bad. You're like pretty good, but you still have this kind of aching sense of, dissatisfaction. And you find yourself, even though life's really good, kind of finding the things to critique, uh, like finding the problems. And every once in a while you step back and you go like, my life's pretty good. Why am I so negative all the time? And you go, ah, there's that dislocatedness. There's something not quite right. Or or maybe you're, you're out with a group of friends and you're laughing and everybody's having a good time and yet you feel all alone and a room full of people. It, it comes up in a, in a million different ways. And again, it's not the crisis. It's just that subtle, nagging sense that something's, something's a little off. Something's not quite right. There's, there's a, this lacking uh, of a sense of deep satisfaction and joy and peace. There's just some place where the peace is elusive. You know, you might look at your spouse and think, wow, I'm blessed with a pretty great spouse, and yet I fight with this person regularly over things that don't matter. Just that lack of peace, right? Here's the good news of the gospel. This sense of brokenness, this dislocatedness, there's not a person in the room that escapes it. This is our human experience. And it doesn't matter if you're not a Christian or if you've been a Christian for 50 years. We don't escape the possibility of slipping into this place or living in this place where we're lacking deep and abiding peace. Wherever you find yourself in that experience today, the good news of the gospel is the same for every one of us in the room, and that is this, that everything, everything, and everyone gets properly fixed and fit together in Jesus Christ. And you got to hear those extreme words that everything and everyone gets properly fixed and fit together in Christ. Listen uh, to verses 19 and 20 in the New Living Translation. The Apostle Paul highlights this. For God in all of his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him, God reconciled most people, most things, right? Everybody that's life is, is simpler than yours, right? It's so inclusive. God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. I kind of like the message version because it, it, it takes that everything and kind of extrapolates it out and says, you know, people and atoms and animal, all of that, right? It, it talks about everything as everything that's broken and dislocated. Everything that is not quite right gets reconciled, gets put back together, gets fixed and properly fit together in Christ. Here's the foundational good news of the gospel, that that all that is not right in this world, all that is dislocated and disjointed in your life and in your relationships and in this world, that God has a plan to put it back together, to put the pieces back together in us and all around us. And and it's, it's called in the book of Colossians a mystery because how in the world, how in the world do we make sense of this mechanism of the cross that the Son of God in the flesh 
who was God, the fullness of God in Christ, dies on a cross. And when we trust in him, that God puts the broken, disjointed pieces back together. And I'll be the first to tell you, I don't understand how that all works. But I can tell you, I've watched it. And so many lives of people sitting in this room, and my own life, and so many others. And all I can tell you is this, that, that it happens. When we trust in Jesus to be the one that puts us back together, he does this work that is supernatural, that is beyond explanation. It's, it's mysterious, and it's beautiful. And it means that we don't have to accept as normal that dislocatedness and brokenness in our lives. Now, I want you to think, like, in your life, where are you experiencing this? Some of you are in that crisis experience. But all of us, I think, have an awareness of some more subtle, perhaps more chronic expressions of this brokenness and disjointedness in our lives. I just want to declare this good news. That doesn't have to be your normal. It doesn't have to be your normal. And and it can be changed. God can put the pieces back together as we choose to trust in Jesus. His life, his death, his resurrection, his spirit working in us that somehow leaning into him is the way that God puts back together the pieces of our lives. Now, um, when I dislocated my shoulder, uh, I didn't tell you how I got it back in socket. The first time, like, only by God's grace, I was rolling around on the floor and just begging for something, and I just kind of pulled this way, and it slid back into socket. And here's the interesting thing. I had never, ever dislocated my shoulder before. But you know what? When it went back to where it was supposed to be, I immediately knew it was back where it was supposed to be. Right? I couldn't explain the the, the, the joint and how it works and what happened when I rolled around on the floor screaming and then it slipped. I couldn't explain any of it. I didn't understand it, but I knew, oh, that's relief. Like the pain went from a 50 on a 1 to 10 scale to a solid 8, right? That was a good direction. And I knew it was right. That's what Paul's saying in this passage. Like, you might, we might not understand how God accomplishes this as we trust in Jesus and the cross, But those of us who have trusted in Jesus and and are allowing him to put back together the broken, disjointed parts of our lives, what we can testify to is we're we're right where we're supposed to be, right? Like he's putting us back together. In, In this passage, in the message, it says that when we trust in Jesus and God does this work of reconciliation, that God makes us whole and holy. The other versions say faultless and blameless in God's presence. That God is putting right the things that are disjointed and out of whack in our lives, and we don't have to understand it to experience the good news of God doing that work in our lives, of trusting with certainty that everything and everyone gets properly fixed and fit together in Jesus. There's not a realm in all of creation or in your life where this good news of the gospel does not apply. I want you to think about that for a second. All of it, like your relationships, every last one of them get properly fixed and fit together in Jesus Christ. Um, this, this passage, uh, God preached at me earlier in the week, uh, actually in the last few days. And uh, I had a, a minor conflict with someone. And um, I don't know about you, my default setting was to, to explain to that person why they were wrong and tell them how I thought they should be fixed. Am I the only person that does that? You're looking at me like, how terrible a pastor is he, right? Anybody else try to fix other people? When th- okay, all right, three of us, great. Shout for lightning in here, you know, none of you honest people. So I was trying to figure out how to fix this person, and, uh, and God brought me back to this passage of Scripture. 
Like, this is the danger in preaching. You have to figure out how to live this stuff, right? And here's where God brought me to. It was a matter of following Jesus to the cross. So when Jesus wanted to fix me, did he zap me and fix me? No, what did Jesus do? Trust in my sacrificial death that gives you life. I'd, I'd rather fix people, wouldn't you? And so that's where it brought me. Like, so instead of trying to fix somebody, I apologized and owned my junk, my junk and how God is trying to fix me and what peace looked like, right? And that's just one little example, but it happens in a million different ways. And what I'm saying is, it's when we come to the good news that everything and everyone gets properly fixed and fit together in Jesus. So instead of trying to fix the people and problems in our lives, in our own resources, in our own way, we trust in Jesus. And so if you're a single person, uh, trying to figure out life as a single person, you, you acknowledge that um, the parts of your life that feel disjointed will not be fixed by more friends or meeting Mr. or Mrs. Wright, that the things that are most disjointed get properly fixed in Jesus and trusting him. For all the married people in the room, the thing that your marriage and mine needs more than anything else is for us to be reconciled in Christ. You think about some of the, the things going on in relationships, and there are you know, some, some spouses that might think um, you know, the, the peace in our marriage is gonna, means we need to talk more, right? And, and there are some that think that peace in your marriage means you're going to be intimate more, and both of those things might help, but only to the extent that we are being fixed and fit together individually and collectively in Jesus Christ. Or maybe you're a, a young person trying to navigate junior high or high school and uh, you think that if you can just get into this group of friends or you just make this team or Lord help us if you just get the perfect HOCO proposal, I'm against them by the way, just going public, all right? Uh, <laughs> Homecoming proposal for those who don't have students. It's a thing, all right? It's a thing. I don't get it. Uh, but if you just get the HOCO proposal, right? Listen, students, the peace that your soul longs for will only be found as you are fixed and fit together in Jesus. As you, if you come to Jesus and you trust that you and your life and your future are found in Jesus. And to the extent that we trust in the girlfriend or the boyfriend or the success here or there or whatever, we miss out on the peace. And as long as we try to apply our fixes to the disjointedness and dislocatedness of our lives, we miss out on the gift of peace that God offers us in Jesus Christ. We miss out on the power of the cross being made real in our lives lives. I, uh, one more story about dislocated shoulders. You would think it's all I did. Uh, so uh, I had this terrible deja vu flashback experience last fall. I played basketball with a group of guys each week, and um, we were playing, and one of the other guys on the court went down, just like, looked just like me, dislocated shoulder. You can recognize it. It's not, you know, it's, you don't have to be smart to know that's a dislocated shoulder, right? In a room full of grown men, I got to tell you this, I have never seen a room of grown men scatter so quickly. It was funny. There are three of us that are standing by this guy writhing in pain, right? And I'm no doctor. I had put a few shoulders back in socket, right? But all I knew was I know how bad he is hurting right now, and I'm going to do everything I can to help the guy. So I tried it was not fun, and I couldn't help him, right? So we tried, but he kind of did the same thing I did, like rolling around, writhing, and his shoulder popped back in socket. And I didn't have to tell him, hey, now it's back in socket, by the way. He knew, right? Right, he knew the instant it happened. Everybody else in that gym scattered, but I had to stick with the guy. You know why? It's not, doesn't take rocket scientists, right? I, I am familiar with the pain of a dislocated shoulder. 
So even as unqualified as I might be to help him, I had to do anything I could to try to help him, or at least to be with him in his pain. And I gotta tell you, that's, that's the same motivation that compels me as a disciple, as a father, as a husband, as a pastor. Like, I don't just believe that this is good news. I am familiar with the pain of brokenness and dislocatedness and being out of whack and out of sorts. Like, that's my journey. And I am a work in progress, and i got a long way to go, but I can tell you every time I have chosen to trust in the good news of the gospel, that, that everything and everyone gets fit back together and fixed in Jesus, God has delivered on that promise. I haven't always understood it. It hasn't always been neat and pretty or easy, but every time I trust in this good news, even this week, right, God delivers on his promises. And I stand here because I'm looking at a room of people that are familiar with the same kind of pain, brokenness and dislocatedness in our lives. And it doesn't have to continue. It doesn't have to be your normal. There's, there's a way out. For my shoulder, it was surgery. After 15 times, there was nothing left to do. Like, you don't rehab it. You just go in and put new parts together. And so it was surgery and significant rehab after that. And it stayed where it's supposed to stay since the surgery, thankfully. And what Paul holds up in this passage is, like, there's a way to fix and fit together that brokenness inside of us. And all of our outside-in fixes will not work. Even attending church, I'm going to be a good person, I'm going to stop these bad habits. Outside-in fixes will not work. Finding this or that out there or this person or that th- or achieving this, outside-in fixes don't work, but if we're willing to trust in Jesus, he does inside-out work. He does surgery on our souls as we choose to trust in the good news that we can't fix it and Jesus can. We choose to trust in the good news that all of our efforts, all of our efforts come up short. And we trust in him and and Jesus does something from the inside out to bring healing to our hurt and the wounds that we've accumulated. He, he, He sheds he puts grace on all of our, ma- our mistakes, past and present. And he, he takes away the guilt and the shame. He sets us free by his perfect love so we, we let go of this constant pressure to perform and produce, to be perfect. He just relieves all of that. And it looks different for every person in the room, but he does this inside-out work that changes us. He makes us new creations. And then we begin this, this lifelong journey. Like there's a moment, a crisis when it begins, when we stop trying to fix ourselves, when we trust in him. And for some of you, today is that day. Today is that day for you. Your first time you're going to say, I spent my whole life with this dislocatedness, and, and I I hadn't really recognized it or looked to Jesus to solve it. And today is that day where you're going to say, Jesus, I I trust you, your life, death, I trust you to put me back together. But even from that crisis, it's a a journey. We we never get to the place where um, we don't regress to old ways. You know, Uh, as a people pleaser in recovery, I never get to the place where I don't sometimes get regress back into that people-pleasing mode, you know? Uh, if, you're, if you're somebody that has dealt with a lot of shame in your life, it can creep up, right? And so there's always new ways. There's always a next step to take to trust Jesus, to put back together, to bring peace in the midst of our brokenness, our disjointedness, our chaos. Uh, there's a, a verse in this passage as I was prepping that kept jumping out at me. It's this verse 23 where Paul says, he's assuming uh, that those he's writing to really have trusted in Jesus. They've experienced God's grace reconciling them. 
But he, he writes this in verse 23, but you must, this is the New Living Translation, you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Continue and stand firmly in it. Like the good news of the gospel doesn't change from when you began a journey with Jesus for some of us in the room, but we can forget, right? We can have a moment where we say, Jesus, I trust you with my whole life, and then, you know, a week later or (laughs) 10 years later, here we are trying to fix people and problems all on our own. Coming to a big decision, and we'll figure out what we think is best and say, God, can you put your stamp on that? I've made a decision, stamp it now, and then I'll go, right? We can forget. And I want to really encourage those of you that are already walking with Jesus today. Like, where's the invitation of Jesus to continue? To stand firm in the good news that always has been true and always will be true. Where, where are you needing to continue to believe that The same Jesus that saved you by his grace is the Jesus who is with you now and walking with you. Now, where where is there some some brokenness, some disjointedness, maybe in you or maybe in some relationships, and you need to stop trying to fix it and and just open-hand it before God? Say, God, I'm going to trust you because I've not been really doing a great job of fixing me or fixing the other people in my life. There's always... And until you uh, reach a point of perfection, which never happens in this church, there's always a next step, right? To trust him, to receive the gift of his peace in a new way. Uh, Here's here's what we're going to do to close a little bit different. I'll invite Jason to come. Because we wanted to create space for us to respond and stand firmly in this good news. And again, whether your experience is more chronic or crisis, we're all in this together. And the good news is the same for every person in the room. So we wanted to create space for you to stand firmly in that and to respond today. And so what I'm going to invite you to do as we close, Jason's going to play a little bit and then lead us in a song. But we're going to just have a, a team of folks up here that are ready to pray for you. We'd love the opportunity to pray with you. And uh, for those who would want, we'll, we're going to anoint you with oil. We're not going to pour a bunch over your head, but what we'll do is If you want to come forward, um, the team will just simply ask you your name and how can we pray for you today? We're really just asking, uh, how can we invite God to fix and properly fit together some of the disjointedness, right? How can we pray for you today? And then you can share with the prayer team as much or as little as you want. And then they'll just put a little oil on their hand and mark a cross on your forehead or if you prefer on the back of your hand and say, I anoint you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then they're going to pray over you. Here's, here's why we do anointing with oil. It might be different for some of us in the room. It's an outward expression, something very physical and tangible that reminds us when you come to pray, I don't have the fix for you. We're trusting that God's Spirit is present to fix and fit us together. And so the oil is that reminder that we are, we're trusting in the, the supernatural presence and power of God to, to do something in our lives. And so uh, Jason invited us, even at the front end of this time, to be willing to step in courage today. And here's what I know. I know there are a boatload of people in this room that need to take a step to trust Jesus to be the one who properly fixes and fits us together. And so I'm going to invite you to step out and just do something to trust that. I'll tell you, for some of you, even coming forward and asking for prayer is a physical way to follow Jesus to the cross. Because the cross is an act of vulnerable, selfless love. And for some of you, who care more about what everybody else is thinking, like just coming up here and saying, I need help, I need Jesus, it's a move to the cross for you. It it opens up God's grace and power working in your life in a new way. So let me invite the prayer team that's going to pray with me to come and join me. We'll have a few at this end and a few at this end. And uh, we've got enough. We can pray for you individually or in groups. And so we'll just kind of see how you want to respond. 
Jason's going to play a little bit. And uh, let me just invite you maybe to pause with me. Close your eyes for a moment. And let's just hold this question before Jesus. Jesus, what are some of the broken and dislocated parts in me or my relationships or my life right now that you're inviting me to trust you to properly fit and fit together? Jesus, how are you inviting me to trust you to bring the gift of peace?